Are you still not playing Pioneer? That just boggles my mind. Why not brew up a budget Bogleless Bogles list to start? Pioneer is the hot new format, and many Magic the Gathering players want a competitive and low-cost entry point to the format. Well, look no further than Budget Bogleless Bogles, a deck that comes in at a mind-boggling $75 or less. Since it's Pioneer, this deck never rotates, its build and strategy is one that's unlikely to be banned, and it's just fun. A great way to learn the format by building a big creature and aggressively attacking our opponents for tons of damage. Those fatal pushes and lightning strikes bounce right off thanks to Hexproof, a deck that's infuriatingly fun for everyone, except perhaps our opponents. Let's take a look. Bogle's builds, of course, get their name from the creature Slippery Bogle, a one-drop from Eventide that we could target and our opponents could not. Well, sadly, the Slippery Bogle isn't legal in Pioneer, but its long-lost twin of Blade Cover Scout is. This creature is in all the best opening hands we can hope for, a simple, untargetable 1-1 that we can suit up with all sorts of powerful auras. We also get to play Basara Tower Archer, where for two green, we get a 2-1 Hexproof body with the added benefit of having reach. We're also going to run two copies of Witch Stalker. This efficient 3-mana three 3-3 three, three has the ever-needed Hexproof, as well as a Hoser ability that punishes blue and black spells that are cast on our turn. And though you might think it's a bit of an oddity, we're going to round out our creatures with two copies of the enchantment creature, Eidolon of Countless Battles. Why? The Eidolon has Bestow and therefore can be cast as a creature or an aura. Since the creature count is a bit low, sometimes we have to cast Eidolon on his own own, but we mostly want to cast it as an aura, which will not only make our creature huge, giving plus one plus one for each creature and aura in play, but it also gives us some protection from the dreaded board wipe, as Eidolon will continue on as a creature after the creature he's enchanting leaves us to settle some wreckage. We don't really play too many creatures and only ten cards with Hexproof, so it's very important in this deck to be unafraid of mulligans, as you never want to keep an opening hand without a creature. And how exactly do we buff these creatures up to devastate our opponents? Let's take a look at the auras that this deck runs. The best two auras in this deck are Ethereal Armor and All That Glitters, and we'll be running full play sets of each. They both give our enchanted creature plus one plus one for each enchantment we control. Ethereal Armor even gives first strike and is very affordable at only one mana. This super powerful card is already a mainstay of regular Bogle lists in formats like Modern. With just two of these effects in play, we are giving plus four plus four, whereas three will net us the nice square plus nine plus nine. Always be looking to get at least one of these powerful auras on your beater to ensure continued growth. But our large creatures won't ever connect if they don't have evasion. Griff's Boon is an aura for one white to give plus one plus zero and flying to a creature. It can even be cast from the graveyard for a pricey white and three, but sometimes the flying evasion is worth even that cost. Gift of the Orzova also gives flight as well as plus one plus one and lifelink. At three mana, it is a bit expensive, so we only run two copies, but the lifelink keeps us racing against any deck choosing to go wide. Another source of lifelink is the very well-costed Unflinching Courage, giving plus two, plus two lifelink and trample for only a green, a white, and one generic. This overclocked aura with any enchantment pumping aura will give us a plus four, plus four first strike trample lifelinker that nothing will stand in front of. We round up the auras with a trip to Amonkhet and Cartouche of Solidarity. Despite being fun to say, Cartouche of Solidarity, Cartouche of Solidarité, is ultra efficient as one mana gets you plus one plus one and first strike, as well as a one one warrior token with vigilance. The token is actually a major attraction here as it gives us a body to block with in a tight race, an extra body to attack with as well, and best of all, protection from edict effects such as To the Slaughter and Blessed Alliance. Nothing will fully prepare us for a board sweeper like Supreme verdict, but if it does come, we can rebuild thanks to a virtual card advantage engine and a little removal. 
Season of Growth is a very important player in this deck. For green and one generic, you get an enchantment that will allow us to scry one whenever a creature enters the battlefield, but it also lets us draw a card every time we hit our own creatures with the spell. And luckily, we have a lot of those. By keeping only one or two hexproof creatures in play at a time, we can be sure to stockpile a safe number of cards in hand to rebuild after a board sweeper and keep digging once we are down to our last cards. We want an open hand with a quick threat and auras, but season will assure us victory in most hazardous conditions. The strategy for this deck is obviously both very linear and very powerful, but we can't completely ignore our opponent. So the deck runs two copies of Silk Wrap and Cartouche of Strength. Silk Wrap is a two mana enchantment that keeps any three drop creature in exile until our opponent can remove the stubborn permanent. And once the enchantment is in play, it'll make our armors and glitters beefy while also removing problematic threats like Rabble Master or Knight of the Ebon Legion or Thing in the Ice, a particularly problematic creature that threatens to undo all our building with its sweeping bounce effect. Another removal spell we play is the Cartouche of Strength. For three mana, we get it all, an aura that gives plus one plus one and trample, as well as a trigger to fight a creature we don't control. This is a little risky since we are opening ourselves up for a pump spell or a flash blocker if we attack afterwards. Always remember the damage your creature took from its fight and be sure that your opponent can't muster the power of blockers to topple your large stack of auras. So now that we have an affordable and powerful battle plan, how do we cover our mana fixing without breaking the bank? Obviously, Temple Gardens are a great source of fixing, but at over $9 a pop, they aren't up to our budget requirements. If you end up loving the deck, they'll make great upgrades, but in the meantime, Scattered Grove is a plains and a forest that comes into play tapped, but also cycles away late game for two mana, and since we don't want our fifth or sixth land drop anyways, it's a great card for the deck and even better at only about $2.50 each. So we'll be running a full play set. We also want a set of Fortified Village, as it makes both of our colors and comes into play untapped if we show a plains or forest card from our hand. And we're not gonna have short supply of those, especially thanks to the Scattered Groves. Speaking of groves, Sun Petal Grove comes into play untapped, as long as we have either a plains or forest in play. This is the most expensive card in the deck at about 450. So due to budget constraints, we just run two of these. Other lands of note include two copies of Castle Ardenvale. This powerful land allows us to crank out 1-1 human tokens for four mana each. It might not seem like much, but being able to make a creature on end step and suit up to attack will let you steal games after a board sweep, as well as a continuous blocker if we are caught in a deadly race. We round out our mana base of 20 lands with four plains and four forests. And while it might seem we need more white mana than green, all of our hexproof creatures are green, and thus our auras become a lot worse if we don't have anything to attach them to. But after we've done game one, how do we fight back against our opponent's sideboarding in enchantment hate and sweep effects? Well, let's take a look at the sideboard. The number one threat to everything we want to do in this deck is Supreme Verdict and Ritual of Soot. So the best sideboard card to bring in would be three copies of a Johnny's Presence that lets us protect any creature for one mana and extend that protection for three mana more per target. Unfortunately, the recently released Theros Beyond gave our opponents Shadow Spear, which is essentially a silver bullet aimed right at us. That's why Pithing Needle is a great inclusion to stop the spear, only it's a bit above budget. And so for this list, we'll instead run copies of Return to Nature, as that has us covered over not just the spear, but also some targeted graveyard hate and an answer to enchantments and artifacts. If you do have the dollars, then I would upgrade to a Pithing Needle, as I think it's superior. We also want to run two copies of Banishing Light as a catch-all answer to any permanent that's giving us trouble, and it also happens to add to our enchantment count. Two copies of Leyline of Sanctity not only keep our hands safe from Thought Seas, but also keep us safe from Settle the Wreckage and To the Slaughter, which are two good cards that are very good against us. Two Spirit of the Labyrinth are great for control decks in the Phoenix matchup, where spot removal will be taken out. This two-mana creature makes it so that you and your opponent are drawing only one card per turn, keeping Teferi and Treasure Cruise in check, while giving you an efficient beater and adding to the enchantment count. Rounding out the side
suicide board, we're gonna have an extra copy of each of our lifelink enchantments. Gift of Orzova and Unflinching Courage to help us race the aggro deck of the format. Now, I'd like to shove a copy or two of Calyx Destiny's hand in here, but while he's still pre-selling for such a high price, we'll go with a copy of Display of Dominance instead. For $75 or less, you would be hard-pressed to get a better deck than this in Pioneer, and its frustratingly uninteractive board state will be the ire of every opponent just wishing their fatal push could do anything in this matchup. I also like that the upgrades aren't that costly. As I mentioned, the sideboard could use Pithing Needle and possibly Rest in Peace, and I could see playing around with Calyx, Destiny's Hand, as well as Heroic Intervention. And the main board mana base, yeah, a playset of Temple Gardens would be great. But all in all, this deck doesn't need much, and already in its budget build is enough to carry you and your bogleless bogles to victory. Enjoy the salty tears of your opponents lamenting the unfair nature of Hexproof. I hope very much this video has been of some help to you. You can help me out by remembering to like, share, subscribe, or just by leaving a message. What deck would you like to see attack on next? Let me know in the comments below. Special thanks to our professional consultant and writer, Ricky Lin of Crew 3, a Pioneer podcast. If you're looking for an excellent Pioneer podcast, then check out Crew 3, whose links I will include in the description below. Thanks as well to our editor, Jonathan Choi and all the patrons over at Patreon. we can easily be ripping three to five cards from our opponent's hand, which gives us the momentum we need to easily take over the game. Our last payoff card is Creeping Chill, a sorcery that drains our opponents for three life for three and a black. However, we will not be casting it in most situations as it will exile for free if it goes straight from our deck into the graveyard. 